Welcome to Gen Z Hoops, the Gen Z basketball coaching and sports business show. On this podcast, you'll learn from professional players, coaches, and executives from all over the world and see the court in a brand new way. And now, joining you courtside, your Gen Z host, John Hartafillis. Today, I'm excited to be joined by Kelly Oubre Sr., the president of Beast Developmental, a solutions-based blueprint that puts an emphasis on gathering information in real time. Mr. Oubre started at Beast Developmental when he started teaching his son, Kelly Oubre Jr., invaluable life lessons about how to be successful. We spoke about Mr. Oubre's role raising Jr. into an NBA star, educating athletes around the country through Beast Developmental, and turning pain points into PowerPoints. Mr. Oubre Sr., how are you? Everything is great. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you. Awesome having you on. I'm really excited about this one. This is one that um, when everyone's connected us, I was really excited for the last few days, weeks about getting a chance to speak with you. So thank you so much for coming on. Uh, to start things off, when talking about adversity, you mentioned before about how we're never victims of anything and that, you know, you personally don't, don't raise victims because you yourself aren't a victim. So right. as a father, how important was it for you to instill that mindset into your son and make sure that he knew that he was in control of his own destiny? It was very important because it was a foundation layer. It was a pillar if you will. It was the brick and mortar concept, but had to be laid on a firm, solid, uh, uh, flat surface so we could uh, build and erect our empire upon that surface. Not leaning, not tipping, not, not cracks, not structural damage later on down the line when, oops, it's too late. Somebody made a mistake back then. But when you're a parent, your margin of error pretty much becomes zero at the birth of your child, which was twelve nine ninety five for me, which meant Whatever I had that wasn't quite completely showed up yet, I better get it together very quickly before he could realize what was going on around us. And I think that was part of my mindset at the time. I was working very hard at two jobs, UPS and WW Granger, and both Fortune 500 companies, one maybe a Fortune 100 company right now, and very uh, good business acumen instilled in both. One was part-time, one was full-time until I opted to be a full-time UPS package car driver which uh, required a lot of discipline, a lot of uh, protocol. I'll uh, give you a little story about UPS. A lot of the people that are outside the organization or outside the driving world don't know is they used to do time studies. They figured it would take us, and they actually timed us. It was, should, should have taken us 17 seconds, get this, 17 seconds to turn the truck off, take the seatbelt off, put the parking brake on, stand up, turn to the right, open the door, grab the package, and be on the ground in 17 seconds. That's a little insight as to how the company would structure their environment and how they would wow. gauge time and production in time. So a lot of that went into, I guess I wouldn't say a militaristic <laughs> uh, 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 mindset when Kelly was born, but I was a trained machine to an extent because I had to make it happen and my margin of error was zero. Definitely um, very regimented in, in how you did things. And you touched on the multiple jobs that you worked, whether it was W.W. Granger, being a full-time job at UPS, or being a special education teacher at uh, Channels UISD. So all these different um, initiatives, what did it mean to you to kind of show your son through actual example what it means to have a strong work ethic? And how do you think that rubbed off on him? I think he, it was more visual with him at some point, because as youngsters, our youngsters are, are like yourself. You guys are very visual. And at some point, you connect the dots. You play a process of elimination, what works for you, what doesn't. But at the same time, I had to factor in one day when he would push back and say, okay, Pop, I got it on my own now. But it's almost like as a parent, I had to, or parent slash trusted advisor, because I'm a combination of both. That's why I try to stress to my parents, you are also a trusted advisor by default. Now, that is power that you need to harness and understand that you have, because if not, somebody's going to come and take that power away from you and take over your young diamond's mind, and they can influence him negatively outside of the way in which you want to. Now, the way that worked out for me and Kelly was, like I said, showing him the way, along with my talk track, a reinforced talk track, if you will, and establishing the same talk track in a consistent pattern as he came through his formative years, and it segued into his, his young journey within karate and taekwondo, in which he got a black belt. Now, with that, that was a foundation layer also, uh, uh, from his young childhood, because I told him, hey, man, you know, if you want to move on to something else, let's do it then. Whatever you want to do, once you get your black belt, we can move forward. So I think, once again, it goes back to that foundation, that stable foundation. As a parent, 
and a trusted advisor, which also morphed me into what I call a clarifier. I'm somebody that can clarify the talk track or my position based on what I've shown him over years and how I've lived my life. So it all ties together, woven together like a blanket, if you will. But it's a great reinforcer for uh, youngsters. And it was a great reinforcer for Kelly. And he still, and we still talk about those days as far back as he can remember, because I can always clarify situations in real time today and base it off of information he learned back then. Well, I love when you brought up Kelly's journey with karate and how you made him get his black belt before anything yeah. else. But you have to get that black belt first and then we can move on. Exactly. Um, what, well, how, why was it so important to make sure that he finished what he started? Of course, it's building that foundation. How has that helped him kind of continue getting better and better and better at, at basketball now all these years later? Because you know what? Just like those pictures on the wall behind you, his black belts never leave his eyesight in any home he moves into. They're there. And if he's ever feeling down, any uh, about a new situation that he doesn't feel he can overcome a new team situation, a new dynamic, a new wrinkle, uh, uh, um, his position in situations, he can look at that as a sense of accomplishment. And there are not that many black belts in the world and they've earned the right to be so, or be called black belt through their structure, their performance and their discipline. So, I think it was a subliminal message I was trying to lay the foundation for early that could be referred to at a later date. He still talks about it all the time, every chance he gets, because it meant something to him even at eight years old. I did that. That's what our youngsters and our young diamonds need to understand, that, that you got to let them know what they did, not so much what they not, they're not doing in that time. Remember when you did this? Okay, let's apply that mindset of accomplishment to this situation now where you may be experiencing some sort of despair or doubt about yourself. Well, if you did this as his trusted advisor, I have to be there for those moments to walk him through those processes from that previous point to the current point he's in at, at that present time. So the disciplinary factors of it all, all, all once again, are woven together within these concepts and these learning, the learning along the way. So he can use it as reference points when I'm not around, when he's experiencing troubled times. And he can have a positive talk track in the midst of a negative situation or a thought process in the midst of a negative situation. So I think that means a lot to not half do it. If you're gonna do it, let's do it the right way. Let's build it the right way and let's formulate it for a position where it can be used as power in the future from pain in the past. Wow, I, I, I love that. That is just incredibly inspirational. And Very thinking much. about all the, the, the many achievements, maybe for you as a father, seeing well, one of his greatest achievements in getting drafted into the NBA 15th overall by the Wizards. What was mm -hmm. it like for you seeing that moment happen and, and realizing that all that hard work paid off and that there's still more work to be done and him getting better every day? Well, it's a culmination and I try to, uh, infuse a time concept to a lot of people because they think they have a lot of time. When time is something that, you know, we take for granted a lot until we don't have any at all. Or we squandered the time we had thinking that we had more, but we were the only ones lying to ourselves the whole time because the rest of the world doesn't see time the way individuals see time. It depends on where you go. It depends on your socioeconomic uh, uh, makeup. It depends on uh, your hardships along the way in how you perceive time as your ally, not your nemesis. And that's my thing. I always talk to Kelly in terms of time must be your ally, not your nemesis, because who really wants an enemy that they create on their own? I'd rather deal with a bunch of unknown enemies and fight them off every day than an enemy I've, that, that's homegrown, you know, under my own watch and that combats me every chance it gets. So let's utilize time as a friend, not a foe. So, I think looking back on it, I think he's, he's getting better at it. Still at a young age, but he's understanding the values of, of his young manhood. And he sees from where he came, he sees the pushback that he had. And now he sees open waters and greener pastures ahead. Of course, and then right before moving into your work with Beast Developmental, I'm curious about when it, when it comes to being a single father, what do you think was your secret sauce and all that in, in terms of what made you successful as a father and, and imparting the values you, you wanted to impart into your son? The ability to formulate my own blueprint in my mind that was malleable. And by malleable, I mean, it, it, it could be uh, tweaked. It could be uh, formulated a different way. I think backwards sometimes. So 
You know, it works for me, it might not work for you. It works for me, that's part of my blueprint. That's part of how I see the world. I look at things from a, a, a nature, natural perspective, hence the name beast developmental. It's a wordplay on the word personification, which is giving human-like characteristics to animals. I flip that word around, the meaning of that word around, where I give animalistic uh, qualities to humans. Hence the name beast developmental. If you wanna be aggressive like a beast, you have to not eliminate the mental components that make you or keep you a, a, a human as a free thinker with a three-dimensional approach and a solutions-based uh, uh, mindset. When it comes to beast developmental, what's the path that you take in preparing parents and their children to have all the success in sports the same way that you did with Junior? What I do is I, I ask them, you know, through a series of questions, tell me some of your pain points, some things you may be experiencing now, have experienced in the past, and quite frankly, give me a, uh, I guess, an outlook of how you would want these things to end up, maybe in one year, five year, 10 years. Where do you want to be at these points in time? Okay, because at that point, I can start to formulate and help you formulate your own blueprint as to how I can help you get there. You can help your young diamond get there as a trusted advisor and a clarifier. And along the way, you can eliminate or cushion the blow from some of these justifiers that are going to start hanging around as your young diamond grows. And he has, he has what they call, quote unquote, market value, like he's a commodity. And he's going to meet a lot of new people. But as long as he understands that that one person is a constant in his life or solid or that one person coupled with a mentorship program, a drone, if you will, like Beast Developmental, overseeing all aspects of his young growth. And their young growth also parallel as a clarifier, as a trusted advisor. As they grow in the journey, they become stronger together and not as a single entity. Fantastic. And then when you touched on the idea of pain points, what are some examples of the ones that you've seen working with your clients that be prevalent for years to come in, in a basketball culture? Well, uh, far too many times I've noticed that with, with regards to those who have means, socioeconomic means, uh, economies, those who have money, basically, sometimes they may feel like their influence can open doors for their young diamonds. Whereas what I've noticed that by the time a kid hits high school, the separation starts. And once they hit that 11th, 12th, that 12th grade year, the separation has not only started, but it's also, it's stopped. So everything leading up to those, that ninth grade year and those three years after that play a major part in that child's life if he's a young ball player going on to bigger and better things, be it under college scholarship or even has pro aspirations and to join the 0.003% that are pros. So I think um, pain point is the misconception that they have time. Pain point is figuring that a phone call can fix everything or my money can change things. Pain point, grossly underestimating the power that they have as a parent from birth all the way through the process. Pain points, playing the uh, you the man game on the way to the game with their kid and on the way home because it's everybody else's fault but yours. Kid knows that he wasn't prepared. Kid knows that he, he wasn't ready. And as a trusted advisor, you must know the same thing. If you're true to, to, to who you are as a trusted advisor, you know, your young diamond will not have misinformation along the way because that's under your control. We have a computer. We walk around with it every day. It's called a cell phone. You can look up anything you want. And that is a tool that eliminates pain points also. Because my thing is, I always encourage my trusted advisors, before you ask a coach a question, put that question out to Google or, or who is it, Alexa, whoever your, your service provider, or your, your, your voice of choice is on your shoulder or your left shoulder, your right shoulder, put that question out there or ask a friend that you trust a lot that you know will give you honest feedback and tell you the real and not what you want to hear. Another pain point, surrounding yourself with all the wrong people. All these things can be flipped into PowerPoints if you just eliminate them or do exactly the opposite. Hence the name beast developmental and the word personification. Flip it around. Am I doing the right thing? Okay, ask as a trusted advisor, 
you don't get a chance to get a bunch of things wrong because the more things that you get wrong with a trusted advisor, you slip away from reality and you become obsolete by your own hand. So I hope I touched on some pain points that are beneficial and answered your question as best I can. I like to paint a picture with my words to at least, uh, you know, give some, some information that can be used, you know, any time of the day. So uh, to eliminate the pain and turn it into power means, first of all, you have to be realistic about everything around you all the time. I always tell people, I do my best not to lie because I can't remember the lie I told yesterday. I, I don't have time for that. I got shit to do. <laughs> I don't remember. What lie did I tell again? I said that. You know, <laughs> you know, so I think being real with yourself, you know, let's, and whatever real looks like though, because there's so many options out here that, you know, your real is, look at your real right now with the microphone in your face. That may have not been your real not too long ago, but that's, that's, you, you, you like what you do. I can see it on your face. You know, you bring value to your situation and to other people. And it's almost like when I said something very poignant, you know, when you tell somebody something, you get my an answer and you just nailed it. I stepped to the right, I stepped to the left, I said, damn, whoever was standing in that spot right there just nailed that. But just, just, just knowing that about the information I can deliver from my heart factually, you know, and, and having an antidote to, to, to go along with it because I've lived it. It's not something I'm pulling out of the sky or reading a book. I lived that. Let me help you with that. Tell me what the pain is so we can flip that into power. That was fantastic. I, I lost <laughs> count of how many pain points you gave, and I'm going to have to take notes after this because that was I have a million. fantastic. <laughs> There's so many pain points to, to kind of think through and, 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 and learn from. On the Beast Developmental Hope page, I couldn't help but notice that you have there that together we will work to master both sword and feather. What does that phrase mean? Ah, you're trying to dig into my brain, I see. I like that. I like that. I like that. Okay. I got this Machiavellian principle thing about me I've had since I was a baby, right? I study styles. I just sit back and I just watch. I mean, I say anything. So, you know, one thing I noticed that uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a history buff. I like, I like, I like pre-American history, that type stuff. Pre-slavery history, I like that kind of stuff. Because it gives, it gives context to where we are today. Now, with doing that, I got to go back and study styles of the day. Proven men, 48 laws of power type stuff. Sun Tzu, the art of war type stuff. Um, Ivan Van Sertima, they came before Columbus. The Olmec tribes in, in Central America. Um, the, the ISIS papers, Dr. Francis Cress Welsing gives context to our present day as African-Americans in America, but it also gives context to you and your nationality in America also, because keep in mind now, during uh, Greek and Roman times, we both were in rulership, you know, and whatever economic, I'm sorry, ethnic group you come from, we work together hand in hand for the collective to be successful, because remember, the barbarians were always at the gate. And back in the day, they weren't coming to say hi. They were coming to take. <laughs> so I think your soldiers would have had to be very, very good at what they did. Your, your blacksmiths had to be very good at what they did. Your seamstresses, your cooks, your kings, your princes, your jesters had to be great at telling jokes or they got beheaded. So let's imagine, if you're not entertaining as an entertainer, we behead you. That's a game changer. That, that lights a fire under you behind. Well, you better figure it out real fast and you better be funny. On my bad day, you better be funny. So just looking at it that way, let's take, let's take the American concept and put it in proper context. Let's go, let's go pre-America here. Okay, you incorporate Machiavellian principles where you study styles. You look at what's worked in the past and what hasn't. You look at whole empires formed and destroyed for whatever reason and apply that to uh, everyday life here in America. And I think it helps me put the, the, the presence of people around me in perspective and not so much be fixated on the social justice issues going on around us because that's kind of two dimensional. What is the end game here? You know, whatever your political affiliation is, that's fine. You can be whatever you want to be. 
But what is the end game to your thought process? Is it for everyone to coexist here? Because nobody's going back anywhere. Or is it for you to stick your head in the sand and pretend that, you know, the tide will stay on low tide and it won't drown you at some point? It's such a beautiful way to describe that that whole idea. And it has me thinking to solve a lot of these problems. It, it obviously, of course, helps to have great communication skills. Mm -hmm. And the industry you're working in is, of course, all about people. So what kind of a role do these strong communication skills play in finding success in your industry? The thing I like about communication and communicating effectively is it gives me the opportunity to practice on the people around me every day. It gives them an opportunity to practice on me every day. And I think it makes us sharper when we practice because we become you know, as, as, as I want, I'm not going to use the word perfect. It, it helps us, I guess, sharpen our skills, our, 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 our skills to interact, not so much communicate, because I can interact with my mouth closed with you right now. I can use sign language. I can use gestures. I can use facial expressions. But the communicating aspect of it, with the higher ups in my business, you know, I have a tendency to paint that picture that I'm an orca. I swim with sharks and orcas. You have to be conditioned into this. You can't just show up one day as a parent or a half-assed trusted advisor thinking that you're going to go and introduce yourself to the owner of the team and he's going to take you serious. without And, and, and you're looking him in the eye. You're appreciating his body of work. You're appreciating everything that went into him, paying his, right now, $2.5 million and lower for his team and not being a savvy businessman before and after he did it. He is who he is. So let me accept him for who he is as he accepts me for who I am. I look him in the eye, I shake his hand, um, and we talk. We have grown man talk. Maybe he's a daddy, we'll have daddy talk. But one thing about it, human beings are human beings. Now this can trickle down to coaches. And I always tell my, my young diamonds and the trusted advisors, I want you to respect coaches. You may hate his guts, but I want you to respect him because he wants to win and he wants to put the best product on the court that wants to win or is willing to do the work to win also. Now, the you the man speech on the way to the game, the you the man speech on the way home by mom and dad or a, 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 a justifier, not a clarifier, because at that point, as a trusted advisor, you become a justifier and you have no, no power if all you do is sing your child's praises and you don't criticize them when it's time in the right way. You are not as sharp as you need to be if you are lying to yourself along the way. When it's time to have these one-off conversations with agents, with, with media, both social and print, when you do podcasts, you can't verbalize or articulate your way through conversations because I guess I don't waste a lot of time looking at somebody's bank account and I do spend a lot of time looking them in the eye. And I think it, it, it brings a... Uh, brings me back to center when I'm in casual conversation or in serious negotiation. Because we're negotiating contracts, we negotiate endorsement deals, uh, but that's the beauty of it all because you know what I can do? I can convey that information in real time to my young diamond. And now he's more business-minded or business savvy because he's seen me engage in conversation, he's seen me do the work, and I'm giving him a three-dimensional approach of the back end of that because he sees the byproducts through his contracts and the dollar amounts on his endorsements as to how you bring this thing three-dimensional and full circle and be respectful with all the parties involved along the way. That's great. And the nonverbal cues were definitely passed on to Junior. How do you, through your work with Beast Developmental, prepare all these athletes for press conferences, media relations, things like that? You know what I do? First of all, I make sure that they're polished as well as they can be. And um, give you a little secret. I try to uh, eliminate the minutiae and keep it as simple as possible by getting them to understand that a, a good talk track from a good ball player after a good game is just like a good talk track from a good ball player after a bad game. I play for a good team and I play for a good coach. The media has to accept the answer for what it is in real time. And the athlete does not say something compromising to himself that could jeopardize his future. And he may not have had a good game. And in that moment, he may not have had time to reflect on the part he played in his bad game. He just may be more outward sometimes and looking to blame somebody else. Because, you know, 
every day we all deal with pressure, but that pressure manifests in different ways when it comes out of all of us. Some people resort to substances. Some people resort to blaming. Some people resort to uh, lashing out. Some people just go into a shell and doesn't, they don't want to talk to anybody. So it's going to manifest in different ways. And I think you know, when you're dealing as a trusted advisor and you're, you're, you're worth your salt, you want to, to be honest with the young diamond and give him those safe spaces that he can go to in the midst of any, any good times and bad. Remaining even keel is very important when you want them to project in these public settings on, on the social media, in a social media world, and even in print when, when they're, they're interviewed right there with a the mic in their face or a beat writers talking to them. So, you know, nothing's wrong with, with all due respect or I respectfully decline uh, to answer that question. With all due respect, um, I'm not at liberty to talk about that right now. Or with all due respect, I'm just here to talk about my family and my team. So there are lots of different ways that, you know, we can navigate through these things, you know, and be respectful to the media because they have a job to do. And there have been some media members that I just looked at them from a vantage point in which I realized that, you know what, they're woefully mistaken in their opinion. And as I read their article, I realized that they typed out the first paragraph and they basically copy and pasted somebody else's article from three weeks ago. So you got to be mindful of that kind of stuff too. When you look at how the media operates, some media, some, some, some media is so busy running from Twitter that they're in such a rush, they'll copy and paste a bunch of stuff after they type out the first paragraph. So with all that, you know, being understood, that helps me formulate with my trusted advisors, a blueprint for their young diamond on how we navigate. You know, and my thing is, just give me a call. We can work this out in five seconds. I'm gonna I'm drill down in that moment and I wanna help them in that moment with, 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 with the full bore of my arsenal of the things I've been through, the things I've gone through and how I've come out of them and how I've helped my young diamond deal with social and print media. Two instances, very strange. I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you this. I'm gonna give you this because I want it on your podcast, all right? When Kelly was at Kansas, Bleacher Report labeled him and Montrez Harrell as malcontents. I had to look up what a malcontent was. Totally off base, no facts, just somebody wanting to create clickbait and get a sound bite. Some guy at Bleacher Report. Don't know who he was. I didn't fire back at him. Okay, buddy, you're entitled to your opinion. Fast forward to a couple of days before the draft. Chad Ford and Ryan Rossillo, I'm name dropping, quoted some anonymous NBA scout as Kelly Oubre is a basketball illiterate. This is going into the draft now. So do I chalk it up as a smear campaign with that statement? I think I kind of know where it came from. And I just smiled because in that moment, I realized that there were powers, you know, at work here to diminish Kelly's draft stock. And I think I could have traced those powers back to some of the people I told no to in the past when they tried to get close to Kelly and I didn't let them. So I'm gonna leave that out there and I'm gonna let them look at this if they even care to see your, see your face <laughs> as you grow in this lane. And, you know, you can at least have that, you know, in, in your book of business. And I hope I did my best to answer the question. But the bottom line is uh, navigating uh, through the media, you know, requires you to lock in and be true to yourself and to be willing and open to understand that beat writers and other reporters and podcasters are humans also. So we all try to operate with a certain amount of respect and consideration here. So I, I, I advise my young diamonds to do the same thing. And that always has to be above board, take the high road because you really don't want to center your conversation too much around I, as opposed to talking about we, because we sounds a lot better. You know, I is kind of self-centered and I don't know if you really want to go there. Definitely, there was definitely so much there when it comes to the media that just is really eye-opening to think about. And, and some of those ideas are, are, are so simple, but you never hear about them. And, and, they, and they really are game changers in that regard. For Beast Developmental, do you work with strictly professionals or kind of with how the game is growing? Have you guys kind of pivoted to college players, high school players, and things like of that nature? Well, I've always worked with everybody. Beast Developmental technically is on paper now, but I've been involved in doing this for the last 20 years. 
you know, it started with Kelly 25 years ago as a concept. 20 years ago, I was in gyms. I started talking to young college players, young pros, young guys training, young guys wanting it all, having no direction, parents hanging around, parents paying their entrance fees and going to sit down in the bleachers, knowing that kids haven't done any work all week. And parents walking in there and having expectations of their kids on a Saturday morning, parents seemingly being disappointed on the way out of the gym. Well, if the kid put no work in, you didn't bring them to practice, what do you think is gonna happen? I was coaching back then too. So I saw the unrealistic expectations placed on a lot of young athletes, a lot of people they thought who loved them. But a lot of times it turned out to be the parent trying to live vicariously through the child without doing the uh, training portion and expecting the, the results to be positive or favorable when it came down to the game type situations. Well, the parents didn't understand when the coach knows he wasn't at practice. His teammates know he wasn't at practice and better yet, he knows he wasn't at practice. So how can he be successful here? Unless he's just that naturally good. And like I said earlier, you're naturally good until the ninth grade. Then you meet the guy around the corner you never knew lived around the corner who, <laughs> you know that guy. Yeah. We all met that guy. <laughs> hey man, I live around the corner. Okay, well in four years, you're gonna watch that guy with all the, the, the accolades and the banners and the letterman jacket with all the badges on it. Wow, I didn't know you played football, basketball, and baseball, and you're a 4.0 student. Yeah, and I'm going to college now too, and I'm gonna leave you, you know, right here, thinking about it the day after graduation about what you're gonna do in the future because his expectations may have been realistic with trusted advisors around him that pushed him and kept information real in real time. And who knows, your information could have been skewed, unproductive, so to speak. And now both of you guys have reached the 11th hour here and y'all are about to go two different directions. Thinking about that definitely puts everything in perspective and everyone knows the kid from around the corner at some point. Yeah. Everyone had him. Um, they know. Me coaching at the freshman level now, I see them all come in and like the year before they were all superstars and now they kind of realize that there's, there's always a bigger fish. Um, moving on to your, your new book, I'm really curious to hear about what the process is like in you writing it and, 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 what, and what your goal is for that book. My goal for the book is to, to break down various aspects of these developmental. Um, I have pillars set up and, and, and just dig, do, doing a deep dive into those pillars and, and just growing them out just to put them in more layman's terms like I'm doing right now. And that's the reason why you know, I'm, I'm accepting of the podcast from young guys like yourself, because I want you guys to be, I guess, conduits for the information that does not make it to the book. I have so much um, information in my head about the journey it's almost like snapshots in my mind and pictures ready to be painted. But I think it's going to be concepts and anecdotes from my journey, you know, along with Kelly to where he is today. So it's going to be, you know, snapshots in time, how things like communication, things like the recruiting experience, things like our mental approaches to the game, his and mine, have changed over the years. Just what the future will look like based on a trajectory that we're trying to take it right now. Um, no one can predict it, but, you know, we can pretty much solidify certain things about it if we make the right decisions now. So I think uh, it's going to be somewhat of a, uh, a look back and maybe a, a timeline along the way, but it's also going to be filled with positivity and, and the respect factor that must be implemented from the beginning to the end of all the people involved in the process. And like I said, some guys, you know, I really don't care for it to this day, but, you know, I respect them. Respect the fact that they put the work in, they're in a position to do good things, and they may have a microphone in front of their face, but maybe they, they didn't look at it that way until they, they hear about it or read it, that it could have affected somebody in the way that it did. And maybe that'll help them shore up on their end how they approach their business moving forward. Because this is an ever-changing climate that we're in, in, in our current COVID era. Things are changing. And that means we as individuals or humans, we must make changes too. I mean, it's almost like, how do you really think the dinosaurs felt? They noticed the weather was changing, but there was nothing they can do about it, except take it. You know, whatever, it got too hot, they couldn't survive, too cold, they couldn't survive. But we as human beings, you know, have the means and the ends to uh, effectively change our own lives. And I think that's, that's what I want to center around the book, just, just hope. Just hope and promise to the future if you lay a proper foundation as best you can 
I'm not perfect. I don't know everything, but I'm a, I'm gonna give it. I'm gonna give my two cents on it, and uh, I'm gonna try to keep it pers uh, in perspective with respect. That's perfect, and I, I can't wait to see when that book comes out. I'm really looking forward to getting my hands on that for sure. And then, what what can we expect to see from Beast Developmental over the next few months, years, and and where can people follow you on social media? In the next few months, doing a lot of podcasts, still putting some things together, trying to take this thing international. I mean, I always tell guys and my trusted advisors early on, like when we were back in Houston, Texas, I said, you know, I looked around and I, was, I, was, I saw the local media being influenced by certain people around us because Kelly wasn't from Houston. And it was easy to slip a guy a couple of dollars and not talk about the hot kid over there in the corner lighting it up because he wasn't from there. Plus a lot of people couldn't gain access to him because they had to go through me and nobody wanted to deal with me. I was a nice person, but who really wants to deal with the gatekeeper if they can get to the kid? Therefore, just situations like that just, just just didn't sit well with me, which 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 forced me to be real, look around, put in perspective, and know I had to do things, you know, and make my own blueprint to do them. And I think that's that that was the beauty in it all because I can look back, you know, and I can clarify, you know, why I did what I did. I always tell Kelly, you know, I have a reason for everything I do. I don't do anything just because. I've always said that to him. And I always say that to him because I want to train his young mind to realize that, you know, I want you to feel the same way. Always have a reason for what you do. Don't do anything just because. Well, it's a great way to end things off and to don't, don't do anything just because. Have a reason behind everything you do. I exactly. absolutely love that. And Mr. Brisson, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. And this will be an episode I will for sure have to, have to take some pretty serious notes on to make sure I have everything all, uh, all up in here too, as well as on, on, on record. Exactly. You can always reach us at at beastdevelopmental.com. If you want to reach out uh, for services, please go to the website, check us out. Um, we're going to be around doing a lot of things coming up. I try not to limit my scope uh, with just basketball related issues. We're moving into the business realm too, because we're getting a lot of calls from Fortune 500 companies about, you know, motivational speaking, but a lot of people want to hear about the Katrina story, but there's just so much more to it than that because that was 16 years ago and it played a major part in our lives and we overcame those things. We were, once again, not a victim of anything, but I think the perspective that was gained from me at the time and him over time kind of helps him deal with the adversities of the day to day. So I think it's beautiful that he's in a position he's in and he can, I guess, sift through some of the minutia and we can both come back to center and grow. Welcome to Beast Developmental. Thanks for listening to Gen Z Hoops. Make sure to follow, like, and subscribe on Instagram, LinkedIn, and all major social media platforms at Gen Z Hoops. You can tune in and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and every other podcast platform on the planet. Get ready for the next episode.